And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are, this. obviously this is not Friday when we're doing this. Because we need, we, before we do the encounterary, we need to wrap up what we started uh, last Friday. Indeed. There were a lot of feats. There are still a lot of feats. And we only got through about... Half. Just, yeah, about half. We only did general and martial feats. The other end is spell and ritual feats, and lastly, ancestry feats. And Ancestry Feats is a doozy. Mm -hmm. Now, last time around I had to apologize for be for being an idiot for the fact that I didn't get Tanner's comment as I do every week. Fortunately, I did get his comment this week, so I, ha so I have that to go by. So, so as always, I asked him his, go his, goal, with fe his goal with Feats and, and his thoughts on Feats as they were used in the past. And... Here's what he had to say. So my goal with feats was relatively straightforward. I actually didn't mind a lot of 5e's feats. There are exceptions, of course, GWF, but I but didn't like having to trade stats for them. The feats made the game more interesting in that a character with a specific feat had more narrative and mechanical flavor, literal win-win in terms of coolness, but since it was either stats or feats, it meant that characters overall wouldn't be as interesting as they could be. 3.5 was also the first system I got to play as a kid, and I still have a soft spot for it, though I've never been a fan of its multi-classing meta, but that's a different thing. So in terms of feats, I wanted something that was honest, meaning that all the feats do what they claim to do, and there's no unintuitive choice that's actually the best, and give a mixture in terms of feeling between the two feat systems. In terms of choice, you also get a pretty good number of them. You're guaranteed one from a specific list from your ancestry, and you also get another choice from your background, so two at first level. On top of that, your ancestry gives you any one of your choice at 4, 8, 12, 16, and 19, in addition to your class giving you one from a specific list at 5, 11, and 17. So there's a lot of r room for variation between characters. That me so that means that it at that means that ideally by the time you're 20th level, you would have 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 Eight, nine, ten feats. It's not as massive of a feat pool as 3.5 or Pathfinder could get at times, but it's certainly better than the four or so feats that you got with 5e. Yep. I think I mentioned this last Friday, but the issue I have with the with um, 5e's feats is that for the limited amount of slots that you're going to have especially given how people rarely do adventuring pa into the teens or beyond that. Um, the feats themselves aren't aren't powerful enough to justify that limitation. Feats are funny that way. I mean obviously they weren't they weren't all that powerful in the in the past because you were meant to build build uh, build upon them as you de as you developed which in my opinion, kind of gets away from the whole from the whole personalization thing. But at the but at the very least, there was an intent. Although, even although I am not going to defend feat design in three point five, we've made that very clear. What with what with me calling it a having more traps than a than a femboy IHOP. Yep. Yep. Or a whorehouse in Thailand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, now there's, I don't think there's going to be as many WTFs as we've had, as we had when we were doing classes, but I think that, I think that's by design. There's certainly going to be some interest, we've certainly had some interesting feats, but it's not like we're going to have a massive amount. And we haven't seen a whole lot in the, in the realm of feat chains. And that may be to, uh, that may be part of the design. Mm -hmm. 
which I'm perfectly fine with because you and I have both had to deal with the with um the issue the issue of picking the right feed for the class fantasy. Yeah. Whereas what we've seen as a general trend with the with both the uh, general and martial feats of last time is that uh, feats are more of a way to get additional flavor because anyone who's been following the series knows each class itself satisfies the class fantasy pretty well. Mm -hmm. These are just adding more to it, not making you less shit at what the class is supposed to do. Hi, yep. th hi, D and D Ranger. I still hate you, except yeah. for the four E version. You're cool. Yeah. So let's get started with spell and ritual feats. And we open right up with a dev note saying, "I have a bit more planned for this section with specialized feats for each of the spells, but I'm not quite there yet in development. There's a lot of cool stuff in this section as is, but eventually every spell will have some special feat for it, as will all of the ritual artistries." Also, there is an even number of core ability re recs in general and martial feats, but not in these. That will not always be the case, but I want to make sure everything I introduce is interesting and has a purpose for existing. I'm kind of iffy about give about giving specific feats to each spell. I think it, I, though, to be fair, I think it's easily, I think it's a bit more easy to justify here than it than it is in other games. I mean, he only has 16 spells total. It would be only 16 additional feats, and you'd only have to take them... Well, I mean, unless he designs multiple feats for each spell, but still. You'd only have to take them if you have that spell, and even then, you wouldn't have to take them to make the spell... to, to pay not to suck, as we always say. The, yeah. the spells are already extremely flexible. I'm wondering if the feats associated with spells would be... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a case of, of um, giving more of those feats, giving more options than the than the um, spells out of the gate have. Yeah, but that's that's my that's my own speculation talking. Yeah, I was I was figuring it was probably just more flexibility. Mm -hmm. So first we have spell study, where you learn a spell of your choice. Not a whole lot more to say about the, about that. Um, it's a it's a way f I'd say it's a way for people to dip a little bit into Gish without ha without going full Inquisitor, although you really should go full Inquisitor. Always go full Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way I see it, uh, since it, you learn a spell of your choice, I would uh, I would assume that you would also get, uh. Spell the spell casting like a, a spell casting table at that point, mm -hmm. um, or maybe you wouldn't you wouldn't have any spell points, so you would just use the base spell without any without any spell point secondary magical effects there. Mm -hmm. So next we have Aetheric recovery. You need to be able to cast spells with spell points in order to use it. Your maximum spell point pool increases by one, and your maximum spell spell point increases by an additional spell point at ninth and seventeenth levels. Whenever you push forward, you can recover one additional spell point. You may recover an additional spell point as you level, gaining a one additional one at ninth and seventeenth. So basically, giving you more, giving you more, S, giving you more SP, giving you more spell points to play with, and more spell points to recover and. see then we have blood magic first off your vitality increases by one second when you cast a spell you may expend a vitality in order to choose a secondary effect for your spell you may only use this feature once each time you cast the spell and if you are able to cast spells with spell points this feature counts towards the maximum amount of secondary options you could normally channel when you cast a spell in this way you take 2d4 physical damage this damage cannot be reduced you need Constitution as a core ability, and the ability to cast at least one spell. Um, I look at the, I look at this as a way to sh a way to shortcut if you ha if you're running short on spell points. Yeah, but this is um, 
This is similar to oh, which which casting class was it that could use vitality to add additional secondary effects? Uh, druid. Yeah, it's it's very similar to druids. Mm -hmm. right, next, we have a bombastic weapon. When you channel a spell through a weapon, you may choose from among the secondary effects of the spell's spell focus options. You may only choose options that change the target of the attack with this feature and increase your maximum SP by one. Obviously, you need to be able to cast spells. Um, I get the feeling you'd enjoy, you'd, you'd enjoy this with the, cro with the crossbow casting so you can turn your crossbows into bombs. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> that guy, that guy's head didn't explode. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, no, he just fell down a flight of punches. More like a flight of kicks, but you're right. Yeah. Next is close quarters casting. When you cast a ranged spell and target a creature within five feet of you, you may choose a secondary option for that spell without expending spell points. You may not choose this. You may not use this feature to channel more secondary options than you normally could achieve in a spell, and you need strength as a core ability. So, once again, it's a it's a very nice um, shortcut. Um, I mean, especially for you know, again, Inquisitor weapon foci, all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm going to cast a spell through my weapon and hit you with it, which is definitely within five feet of me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, extra secondary effect for just some more juicy damage. Okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. Let's go. <laughs> Actually, Bombastic Weapon and Close Quarters Casting would make for an interesting... No, what? No, wait, I take, I take it back. They wouldn't, they wouldn't combine all that well because it's a ranged spell. So it's a bit. So it's for those who are who are using a focus who get who happen to get in close. Oh. But next we have counter spell. Mm -hmm. When an enemy within sixty feet of you hits with a spell attack, you may use your reaction in order to attempt to counter that spell. You may attempt to counter the spell in one of the following ways: either a make a spell attack against the creature's highest mental defense; they receive a plus one bonus. To, to its defense for each secondary effect it channeled into the spell. And on a hit, the spell's effects are nullified and the attack is considered the miss if the creature if it if the spell the creature is casting is among your known spells, make this with this with advantage. Or expend a number of spell points equal to the number of secondary effects the creature channeled into the spell. Then the spell is nullified, though they still lose resources as if the spell hit. If the spell the creature is casting among your known spells, you only have to expend half. Requires intuition as a core ability. So you can you can either you can either take the risky route or you can take the safe route. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not something that you'd that would be a good idea to to use the latter approach all that often, but it is a good way to get someone to mutually waste resources. Mm -hmm. It's not too far removed from the from the what are you willing to bet with our system. <laughs> yeah, true. Next we have spell specialization. Choose a spell from among the spells you know. That spell gains the following benefits. A. When you make an attack with the selected spell, you can add plus two to the roll. Your B, your threat range for the for attacks with the selected spell increases by one. Or C, do, if it does not require an, an attack roll, you can choose one additional secondary option for the spell without spending spell points, but that option still counts towards your limit. And let me make one small edit there. And of course you can pick it multiple times. So Again, it's bet it's better ver it's better version of the spell you're already casting. Yeah. Next we have empathetic caster. Whenever you cast a spell with additional secondary effects, 
You may purge an amount of condition severity from a creature within 30 feet of you equal to the amount of secondary effects for which you expended resources, including spell points, vitality, or hit points. I think that for which you extended, expended, expended resources is key with this one. Otherwise, mm -hmm. with some of the combinations of free secondaries, it could get abused. Yeah. Uh, and it requires intuition. Let's see, then we have Iron Willed, ca Iron Willed Caster. The Dispirited Condition does not impose disadvantage. So even even when you're getting your ass kicked, you can sit. You can still you can still keep casting. Uh -huh. uh, let's see, then we have hastening spell. I'm starting to get some deja vu. Whenever you cast a spell, you become hastened one for every two secondary effects channeled into the spell, rounded down minimum one until the beginning of your next turn. You may only gain the event, the benefits of this effect once per turn. And let me. S could you dig? Could you dig up um, the effects of hastened? I th I believe it. W I believe it was just um. Incre inc a bit. I keep thinking a boost to initiative, but I'm trying to recall the effects of hastened. Give me a moment. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um... I'm not sure it's called hastened anymore. Because it's not finding the word hastened in... Looks like we, looks like we got one. Looks like we got one of those. Yep. I gotta go to the conditions... Come on, come on, come on, come on. I think it's the uh, I think it's quickened now. The opposite of of hindered, maybe. I believe that's what that's one of those things that I think need I think needs to be needs to be needs to be clarified. Um, well, because hindered hindered condition is the one that slows you down and stops you. Quickened is the opposite. Mm -hmm. So I'm. I am very sure that this is not. Um, I, I'm I'm pretty sure it's a uh, it's an artifact. I'm pretty sure it's yeah. quickened. Let's see. Next is Spellblade. Your threat range with attacks using a weapon focus for a spell increases by one. And the minimum damage on any dice roll for an attack using a weapon focus for a spell increases by two. <laughs> oh no! That's not something you just throw on an Inquisitor. Not at all. Especially since most, especially since most weapon focus spells are going to be using d sixes. Yeah. Let's see. Then you have. Improved spell surge. Your threat range for spells increases by one. Then we have mage armor. Interesting that that's a feat and not a spell. Uh, whenever you fight defensively, you may use your highest mental ability defense as your highest physical defense. It's a good way to keep. Ma that's a that's a anti squishy option. Uh -huh. And you increase the mental defense associated with your class ability by one. See next we have minion master. Whenever a minion within sixty feet of you takes damage, you may take that damage rather than your minion. Damage taken this way is reduced by your class ability modifier to a minimum of two. Damage minions deal increases by one die type. So there's actually a reason to take that to take it. Indeed. Mm -hmm. See then we have polymorph. 
When you place a curse upon a creature, you may also change its size, reducing its size by one category. You may additionally curse the target with a severity of conditions which best describe the target's change in size depending on the tier of material used. And it's one, it's one, it's one for one on the tiers. The player may choose which conditions to set from among the negative conditions, but must okay their choice with the GM. The creature's appearance can also be changed in this way through the transformations are limited to noticeable malformations of the body and do not affect the target beyond the additional conditions caused by this feat. You need the malediction artistry for this. Yep. Um, see, next is reflexive rejuvenation. When an ally within reach of your rejuvenation spell takes damage, you may cast rejuvenation on them as a reaction. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting indeed. See, so next is Spell Sniper. Sniper, no sniping. Uh, when you cast your spell through a spell focus, your range with the spell increases by 15 feet. And that's saying something, because there's already, there's already... I think most spells have the range of 30. And your spell attacks may ignore 3 severity of the hidden condition. Nice. Uh See, next is somatic components. You may amplify a spell you cast by pr by providing somatic movements as a quick action, 15 feet. You must have a free hand to provide somatic components to a spell. When you provide somatic components, you may increase your threat range by 2, but attacks made against you are made with advantage until the beginning of your next turn. Requires dexterity as a core ability. So it looks like the component setup are feats that you don't need but you can add, but you can add to put a little oomph. I'm perfectly fine with this, so I don't especially since if I'm being honest, when it comes to whether whether I need verbal, material or somatic components, I rarely mess with that stuff when I DM. Mhm. Uh -huh. I only I only re because I I only really it only come it only comes up in very specific circumstances anyways and I find I find that depending on the setting, I have a hard time justifying some of the components, especially with especially how some of the spells are really anal about what you need. Yeah, and well, I well yes, I do agree with Tanner that there's a fair there's a fair amount of resource management intrinsic to role playing games. There's there. That doesn't. That does not mean that I should. That I should feel like I have to itemize my inventory like I'm a goddamn accountant. Which is why his inventory management system is much more streamlined. Mm -hmm. And ours is too. Yeah. See, so then we have verbal components. When you cast a spell, you may provide verbal components for that spell. Doing so marks you and makes you vul marks to you and makes you vulnerable to. These conditions act like a wound, but expire when you push forward or rest. When you provide verbal components for a spell, you may make the attack for that spell with advantage. Requires wits as a core ability. So, I get that they that they give you that they give you conditions when you're using them, um, or at least in this case, verbal components do. Why would why would it mark you and make you vulnerable un as as a wound until you uh, push forward or rest? Is my question because I figure like end of encounter might make sense, but the only reason I can think of that a verbal component marks you and makes you vulnerable is because you're chanting. So you have to you're marked because you're making yourself obvious. And you're vulnerable because you have to concentrate on the chant. When you stop doing that thing, it doesn't seem like those conditions would exist. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not opposed to the to the um, to the component to the um, condition itself, but having it last that having it last that long seems a bit much. And additionally, what if somebody wants to use verbal components more than once in before the next push forward or rest? Does it stack those conditions so now you're marked for vulnerable for etc. all the way up to maximum component uh, maximum ten? Mm -hmm. 
At least I think it's a maximum of 10 for marked. Um, no, marked just... Just uh, keeps going, apparently. I'm not sure. Uh, you, you, uh, I, want, I wonder how that's worked out in playtesting. That's something I'd want to know from Tanner. Yeah, especially especially since, like i I can see it, I can see it lasting until the until the start of the until the start of the the start of the next round. But, do, but doing it doing it um for the it's the amount of time that it takes is where is I think where we have our issues. I think that yeah. is something that should either get we should either I I prefer getting getting some clarification. Or giving it a giving it a bit of a fixer upper. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense that once you've stopped chanting, once you've stopped using that verbal component, the conditions caused by it would remain unless chanting somehow magically kills kills you. Because <laughs> those those two things stacked together are actually. Just, just as, just as, just, just, when you're marked, for each severity of the condition affecting the, a creature, creatures which attempt to perceive or attack one of the creature's physical defenses increase the chance they will automatically succeed the roll by one. So at two, uh, you'd be 15 to 20 for a to hit. Um, and then, of course, for vulnerable, you know, that's one of our favorite ones where you're where the crit range against you gets increased. Uh, each severity of vulnerable increases the threat range for attacks against it. So instead of it being 20, it would be 18 to 20, and, and 15 to 20 for an auto hit. Um, and then, of course, if the severity of the condition surpasses your fortitude or focus, not likely to happen at just two, but still... Um, then attack against the physical and mental defenses have advantage. Depending on whether it's fortitude or focus, you have you have exceeded, uh, respectively. Um, so having that last forever, or at least well, at least until the next time you push forward or rest, um, seems like an awfully big deficit. For it, a, 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 a momentary benefit, which is attack with that spell with advantage. Doesn't even... I mean, I, that, that's a very big deficit for a very small... Um, very small benefit. Mm -hmm. I, I feel that's not very well balanced. <laughs> it... At least it's, not very well balanced within everything we've seen within Heavens and Heresies compared to other game, uh, other five E hacks and such. I get the idea. I get the idea that that we're going for with somatic and verbal components as feats. The idea is give your spell, give your spell casting a boost at a, at a detriment. Yeah, but somatic, it's just oh, you spent half your movement as a quick action to do the somatic component. Mm -hmm. You're you're spending a resource to boost a thing, which perfectly fine. Um, you get that movement back on your next turn. The, the other, well, the other thing is that somatic thematic makes um, is get, puts puts your defenses at a disadvantage because um, yeah, attacks made against you are made with advantage until the beginning of your next turn because mm -hmm. you had to use your hand. Mm -hmm. Wait, again, though, that's that's all. It's in the moment. You get the momentary boost with the momentary deficits. Whereas with verbal, you get a momentary boost with a deficit that lasts a really long time. Mm -hmm. And those deficits are worse than just attacks having advantage against you. Like I said, marking and, and and being marked and being vulnerable makes it just outright easier to to critic to crit you and hit you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
So again, again, a little clarification will go a long way on that front, Tanner. Um, next is wall spell. So, so when you want, so when you want to have a, a spell, a spell book from the dark side of the moon. I was going to say, wait a minute, is this a zero seven spell? <laughs> When you cast a spell through a spell focus, you gain access to, a di to an additional secondary option for that spell. You can change the target of the spell area up to an, to an area up to 60 feet long, 20 feet high, and 1 foot thick. The wall is semi-transparent, and, cre and creatures and projectiles can move through it, though creatures are hindered too when doing so. When a creature is targeted by an attack through the wall, it is considered to be hidden too. If, a, if the spell affects creatures, the area is considered to be afflicted as well. Its affliction counts down from the beginning of your turns, and the wall only fades when the area's affliction is reduced to zero. Creatures that end their turn in the area or pass through it for the first time on, on a turn are also inflicted, afflicted too with a type matching that of the spell. An interesting way to do a spell yeah. wall. Mm -hmm. And it it's also it also means that you can do this kind of thing without having to determine what spells are going to count as a wall because all the spe all the spells that we have could theoretically count as could could be used as one. Yeah. Let's see, next is wounding spell. You gain the following secondary option for the spells you know. Up to plus 2 severity of Harmful conditions applied to your spell are applied as a wound instead. The afflicted condition is considered to increase sources of damage of the afflicting type by one rather than doing periodic damage to the creature. Requires wits as a core ability. Ow. So you can af afflict a condition, or two severity of a condition as a wound with a wounding spell. Mm -hmm. As a secondary option. That's a... Uh... See, that's a really powerful feat. Yeah, I'm. I'm. That's a. And keep keep in mind. Keep in mind, each secondary option only costs one spell point. Yeah. I mean, this 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 would actually require you to either use the version of the spell that uh, afflicts a a. Uh, condition, or you know, spend an extra spell point to do damage and afflict a condition at the same time, which you know, I I have no no uh no qualms against making you use a few more spell points to inflict an actual wound on whatever you're shooting. Yeah. Um. That's pretty cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. Next, we have Warcaster. Oh, this is something else you could just give to your uh, your Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. You may treat a <laughs> weapon or shield as a spell focus rather than a weapon focus. <laughs> a shield as a spell focus. Oh, God. I mean, Monk, how else did Captain America make all of his shield throws? <laughs> when a hostile creature's movement provokes an, an opportunity attack <sighs> from you... You may use your reaction to cast a spell at the creature as an attack of opportunity rather than making a weapon attack. The spell must have a casting time of one action and must target only that creature. <laughs> and then... Requires and, and, strength or dexterity as core. Which, again, Inquisitor has to have strength or dex and intuition. Mm -hmm. So... Um... Yeah... You you see you see in my hands a, a sword and a shield, but in these hands they are but spell foci. Mm -hmm. but, but this one can still be a weapon focus if I want it to be. And then the the enemy's like, "What? That's not fair." Who said life was fair? Yep. Um, you're not trying to fight fair. You're just trying to you're just trying to fight. You're just trying to win. There is no such thing as dirty tactics. Just tactics. Yep. It's one of my favorite uh it's one of my favorite uh humanity fuck yeah versions on um on the space forums and stuff too because uh 
what are all these dishonorable things you're doing? Oh, humanity doesn't fight for honor. We fight for survival. Fuck your honor. Yeah, we saw how we saw how well that whole fighting for honor thing worked for the clans. Never forget two kid. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we also see how well honor uh, carries onto the battlefield in real life. I mean, just go look at history. Sure, there were codes of chivalry and Bushido and all those other honor codes around the world. Get any of those fuckers on a battlefield. Code of honor, what? Does that exist? Can at you the risk eat it? Of, at the risk of butchering Latin, inter arma enem silent legus. That was butchered. Thank you. <laughs> well, not, I don't. I'm not going to. I'm not going to fuss about the proper pronunciation of a dead language. I mean, just. Remember, remember that there's an even, uh, there's an even simpler term, monk. Civis pacem parabellum. Yeah. But and anyway, that covers all of the spell and ritual feats, and I think the last few giving additional options kind of hints at what we were suspecting. Yeah. So if if that's the if you if we have that for specific ones, so that so that somebody can get more f more um, fire out of their fire casting, yeah, I'm perfectly fine with that. Be really be really funny if somebody can use this to throw around a magical version of Greek fire. I would love to create medieval napalm. <laughs> I do I do remember one of I do remember one of my players a long time ago um created the medieval equivalent of thermite. I mean that that's not hard. Mm -hmm. Anyway, now with ans with for with ancestry feats. First all, of all, all this of, is <laughs> all of the ancestries have have a set of feats except for the Harui. Or other folk. Because they're too special. They're special snowflakes. Yeah. It's saying, um, as is apparent, other folk do not have a list of ancestry feats. The diversity of their physical characteristics means that rather than a codified list of shared traits, as might be represented by a list of ancestry feats, other folk draw from the non-ancestry based feats for their characters. Yeah. On another note, um, the... The ancestry feats can only be taken of any specific ancestry can only be taken by that ancestry type. So, elves, dirty fucking knife ears. You can't take any of the dwarven feats. You even try your skin, you alive and drain your blood for my next ale. <laughs> I might taste a little sour, but it'll be great and rich. At least the knife ears will be useful for something then. <laughs> but uh. It's also the single largest section on this document. Mm -hmm. it, while spell, while the spell and ritual feats and ancestry feats together are half a document, and the general feats and the martial feats are the other half a document, the ancestry feats by themselves are like a third of the scroll bar. So this is our long haul, people. Mm -hmm. Hope you hope you packed hope you packed a lunch. Opens with a nice dev note. Mm -hmm. These will be fine-tuned before the start of my next playtest campaign. Right now, there are a few of them that are not quite balanced correctly, and I'm going to be implementing the latest patch here shortly. Also, the intent with the ancestry feats is to make relatively strong feats that are varied. Some of the time, there are feats here that grant relatively more than some non-ancestry feats, but they are varied enough that it would not make sense for any sort of build or playstyle to only pick ancestry feats. On top of that, the feat choices are curated. While the feats granted to a character by the, their ancestry can be of any type, feats granted by class are generally of a specific non-ancestry type. Mm -hmm. So, first we have dwarven feats. 
Starting with... The best feats! <laughs> starting with Storm Ancestry. You gain resistance to lightning damage. When you hit a weapon attack, you can change its damage type to either lightning or thunder. When you utilize your Not Today feature, you may make a skill attack against creatures within 10 feet of you, targeting their constitution defense. On a hit, a creature is stunned. The severity of the condition is equal to your proficiency modifier. So, uh, for for a reminder, since we haven't done the Ancestries review in such a long time, mm -hmm. man, that was months ago, not today. When an enemy hits you with an attack, you may grant yourself resistance to that attack's damage. If that attack would also impose a condition on you, you may have the severity of that condition rounded up. You may choose to use this feature after the GM has rolled for damage. You must push forward or rest in order to use this feature again. Mm -hmm. So... When you use Not Today, you can make a skill attack against creatures within 10 feet of you, targeting their con defense, and stun them. Mm -hmm. And the severity is equal to your proficiency mod. Yep. Nice. Let's see. The uh, prerequisite is no other is no other ancestry feats. Um, so you have so you, if you take it, you have to take it before you take other ancestry feats, or can you take it and then? not take any other ancestry feats. I think I think because of the fact that it's going into a su a subspecies of dwarf, I think it I think you I think you would I think you would have it would have to be the former. Uh, no, I think I know what it is. Um there are literally feats in the dwarfs here that say storm ancestry, earth ancestry. Stone ancestry, fire ancestry, frost ancestry. I think when it says ancestry feats, that's what it means, and not literally the entire category of ancestry feats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that is some that is some that is some very confusing terminology. If it were me, I would change it to something like storm bloodline or storm clan and then you say no other bloodline or clan feats just a recommendation tanner because saying no other ancestry feats in an entire section that's that that's that the headline for every feat in this in this section is ancestry feats that's a little confusing terminal in a terminal terminology sense Anyway, <laughs> yeah, we have Dwarven Fortitude. Increase either your constitution or resolve by two. The chosen ability must be a core ability. Oh, that's great for any barbarian. And dev note, every ancestor, every ancestry gets a stat feat like this, but since you get so many feats in Heavens and Heresies and you can't pick the same feat twice unless explicitly stated, it doesn't mean someone who picks it won't be interesting. It's also my way of nodding to tradition, by which I mean 3.5, since that's what introduced me to TTRPGs, while still keeping each ancestry balanced with every class. As it should be, stat boosts are balanced with other feats. It's an equal choice. He's got a point. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next we have Dwarven Endurance. Increase two of your physical defenses by one, and whenever you fight defensively in combat, you gain a number of temp HP equal to your proficiency modifier plus your class ability modifier. Nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that 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 temp HP doesn't stack if you get if you um. If temp you... HP doesn't stack unless it specifically says it stacks. So the, mm -hmm. uh, t um, all the way back in the class the base mechanics uh sheet. Yep. Uh, temporary HP acts that if a new source of temporary HP comes in, uh, that is higher, it'll replace the old. Temporary HP. So all that you do if you fight re fight defensively is just reset the temp HP. Yeah, I know that we was it a feat earlier that said that there was a, you'd get some temp HP that stacks. Can't remember. I'd have to look go look at it again. Yeah. But next we have dwarven combat proficiencies. You learn one of the following fighting styles: counter fighter, great weapon fighter. Positioning or protection requires strength or dexterity as a core ability. 
the dev note. I'll put a list of the fighting styles somewhere at one point, at one spot, at some point. Also, I know there is already a feat that grants great weapon fighting. The point is that at first level, dwarves can pick from a smattering of curated feats or one of their ancestry feats. So if they wanted great weapon fighting with one of their ancestry feats, they could do so. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. It's a way. It's another way to get a thing that you want. Uh, next we have Earth Ancestry. Your willpower increases by one. You gain resistance to psychic damage. And you gain two temp vitality when partaking in meals. Two additional temp vitality. Holy shit. It sounds like that's probably something our dwarf druid has. Probably. <clears throat> probably. What and he probably think? cooks pretty well because of it. See, then we have the Stone Ancestry. You gain plus one damage to attacks made with axes, mass weapon, flails, or en or weapons with the heavy trait. <laughs> you may expend the vitality when you take bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage in order to grant yourself resistance to that image instance of damage. And you gain one additional point of damage reduction when you fight defensively. Can you... Can you... If you use the Stone Ancestry Vitality to grant yourself resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, slashing, can you stack Not Today on top of that? I really gotta know. <laughs> because if you can stack Not Today on top of that, that's immunity to that damage source. Because mm -hmm. two, two instances of resistance is immunity in the system. I gotta know, is that something that can be done, Tanner? Because that sounds, it sounds like I can break things. Mm -hmm. um, also, to anyone wondering, you may be thinking to yourselves, dwarves work in rock. They work in, in the earth. They work in the mountains. They're miners, and they go and find treasure. Why are they always proficient in axes? Axes aren't used underground. Pickaxes would make more sense. My answer to you. <clears throat> the fucking knife ears live in trees. <laughs> so there you go. Just a little tidbit. Elves live in trees. Dwarves are good at axes. You make the connection. So next we have Mountaineer. You gain proficiency in the athletics and nature skills, and your climbing speed increases by five feet. I'm going to be honest. This makes sense, at least mountain climbing. Mm -hmm. But can you imagine watching a, a dwarf spider climb a tree going after an elf? Yes. Not even bothering to chop the fucking tree down. Come after you, you need fucking knife here, you wee fucking bastard! Get up back, my fucking axe! <laughs> um, so next we have Steadfast. Attacks which attempt to move you, knock you prone, hinder you, or weaken you are made with disadvantage and increase your fortitude <laughs> by one. Two. No, so two. Fortitude by two. <laughs> Attacks... So attacks which attempt to reposition, hinder, or weaken you, essentially. Mm -hmm. Made with dis... Jesus Christ! Wow. Let's see, then we have Fire Ancestry. You gain resistance to fire damage. You may expend vitality in order to imbue a weapon with part of your being, granting it bonus damage. Vitality expended in this way cannot be regained unless you recall your spirit from the weapon after a rest. Doing so removes the weapon's bonus damage. The, this damage bonus also fades when you die. A weapon Obviously. may only have one imbuement of this nature at any given time. So, for each tier, you grant one, bo you grant one bonus damage. At, f at, first, t at um, first tier, it costs one vitality. At tiers 2, 3, and 4, it costs... At, at, at no. just 2 and 3, it costs 2 vitality, and 
And after that, three vitality. Yep. And uh, I I do have to say that last part, this damage bonus also fades when you die. Um, considering that you're imbuing a weapon with a part of your being, that that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> once you're dead. Uh, you can't really imbue anything with with that spirit of your being anymore. Yeah. Let's see, and the last one we have is Frost Ancestry. You gain resistance to frost damage. Your movement increases by 5 feet. Each round, you have 10 additional feet of movement, which you may only use to move toward a threat. I like the flavor text. While stone dwarves might be the largest in terms of weight... Frost dwarves are the tallest, and not much thinner than their cousins. And this ties into the fact that dwarves are descended from their from the giants. Mm -hmm. So, uh, frost ancestry just turns you into a Yodun dwarf. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. You're a fucking Yotun dwarf. And I can't, I can't help but one. I can't. When it comes to the other ancestries, I can't help but wonder which. We already, fi we already figured out that our, that our dwarf, our dwarven druid is a. It has earth ancestry. Probably doesn't get along with with um people from storm ancestry. Probably gets along decent with stone ancestry, and prob. And fire and fire and frost is probably a case of hasn't seen them in a while. Probably doesn't care either. <laughs> Let's see. Then we get to elven feats. Can we skip? <laughs> no. No, I'm, I'm kidding. His elves are not are not the same as the elves we hate so much. Mm -hmm. They're still bloody knife here, so. So first we have <laughs> Lunari bloodline. You gain proficiency in Arcana. You may attune to one additional magic item or trinket. That opens a lot of possibilities. And you gain proficiency in a ritual artistry of your choice. See, this is actually called a bloodline. This isn't called an ancestry. This is called a bloodline. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Lunar Exalted say what? <laughs> not, <laughs> um, not enough shape-shifting. Ritual artistry, monk... I'm just say, I'm just saying if I if I see a Lunari with a, with a bunch of glowing tattoos I'm calling foul. <laughs> Ritual history <artistry>, monk. <laughs> yeah. So next is Elven accuracy. Figured we'd see that one. It just says win more. <laughs> Whenever you have advantage on an attack roll, you may add an additional plus two to your highest roll. In addition, when you, whenever you score a critical hit on a creature with an attack roll that deals damage, you may apply either two severity of the hidden, hindered or weakened condition on that creature. That's nice. I'd probably apply weakened more often than not. Yeah. Let's see, next is mobility and understanding. Increase either your dexterity or intuition score by two. The chosen ability must be core. And, and this is again level or above. Yep. And this is again the, the same as the dev note above. This is this is yeah, you're getting what's essentially a ASI, but it's a it's the same sort of it's as useful as anything else and it isn't just um something to ignore. Mm -hmm. Phase acrobatics. You gain proficiency in the athletic skill. Whenever you fight defensively, your highest physical defense increases by one, and you gain ten feet of movement until the beginning of your next turn. And just requires being an elf. Oh. Sensing a bit. It's... Is it good? Am I, am I going to be? Is this the this version of the Eladrin teleport? <laughs> oh. uh. Let's see, next is Solari bloodline. You may Solar exalted. Say what? 
<laughs> <laughs> you may attune to one additional magic item or trinket. Your dark vision may ignore four more severity of the hidden condition caused by darkness. And increase your lowest increase your lowest physical defense by one. You can cause your skin and hair to glow with radiant light as if under the effects of torchlight. 30 feet, 30 feet of bright light and 30 feet of dim light beyond that. You may activate or deactivate this ability as a 10-foot as quick action. In addition, this creature dispels magical darkness depending on your level. So go, from the tiers, it goes common, uncommon, very rare, very rare, and legendary. And it means it dispels common magical darkness, uncommon magical darkness, etc. Um, like I said, Solar Exalted, say what? Yeah, I was I was gonna say no. This no, this is more akin to high elves, but then that shows up and we're like, nope, solar exalted. They're um, fucking glowing, monk. <laughs> and besides, he loves exalted as much as we do. Yeah. Um, next, we have the Kalasari bloodline. Attacks made to confuse you are made with disadvantage, and you cannot be frenzied from being confused. You may attune to one additional magic item or trinket. You learn the Rift spell and may expend a Vitality in order to choose a secondary option for the spell. This feature cannot be used with class features that grant you access to secondary options for spells. Did Uriel Exalted say what? <laughs> oh. See, so next we have Planar Regeneration. Your Fortitude increases by 1. Whenever you or an ally within 30 feet of you expend a Vitality while pushing forward, it heals for an additional hit point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that basically is increasing the vitality the vitality multiplier when you're using when you're using those to push forward. Yep. You, one one additional hit point per vitality spent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially. So then we have planar diffusion. If you would gain hit points that would heal you over your maximum amount of hit points, you may use those hit points to heal an ally within 30 feet of you. That's a nice way to do. That's a nice way to do overheal. Uh huh. Whenever a spell or feature would grant you temporary hit points, you gain additional temp HP equal to three plus the proficiency modifier of the character, which used the spell or feature. Oh. 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 Man, that is gonna proc so on so many different class features too. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see, and last for the elves, we have the Silwari. Blo Actually, no, I, I take that I take that back. I for nope, never mind. It's again, again, the page break screw um threw me off. Yeah, it's it's the two it's the two column format. Yeah, yeah. the Silwar anyway, Silwari bloodline. Increase your vitality by one. You increase your fortitude by one. You may attune to one additional magic item, and your movement increases by five feet. Terrestrial exalted say what? <laughs> it's true! They're the dragon blooded! You know, less less special stuff than other exalted, but much more numerous. Mm -hmm. Fucking uh, Christ. The fact that I can just do... You turn the elves into exalted and I like it. <laughs> I feel dirty. Yep. Let's see, next we have Felborn feats. Infernal Exalted say what? <laughs> Are we sure they aren't Abyssal Exalted? <laughs> Why not both? <laughs> so, first we have Demonic Resistance. Here, Demonic hit. You choose a damage type, either Fire, Poison, Cold, Acid, or Psychic. You gain resistance to this damage type. If you already have resistance to the chosen damage type, or gain resist or gain resistance from a later feature, you gain immunity to this damage type instead. Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Next is Eyes of the Infernal. If darkness, be it magical or non-magical, would render something as hidden from you, you may ignore up to four severity of that condition. Features which would increase dark vision increase this feature instead. And Hello, Devil's Side Eldritch Invocation. Mm -hmm. And you <laughs> gain proficiency in investigation. Oh, hey! Huh. Hmm. This might tip the scales, Monk. <laughs> <laughs> 
Remember, remember, remember. I was I was not sure which ancestry. Mm -hmm. Might tip the scales. Yep. So next we go with next we have knowledge of Gehenna. You can read all mundane writing as if it were written in demonic. The seat does not allow you to read magical runes or uncover secret messages hidden within mundane writing. And you gain proficiency in history and arcana. There's a dev note going. I'm going to redo the way ancestries learn yes. languages. Just a note here so I don't forget. Most will know common and one other of their choice rather than a, rather than set languages, I think, since language is more of a background thing. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Let's see, so next we have Infernal Aura. Choose one of the following damage types physical, fire, frost, acid, aether, psychic, or poison. Whenever a creature hits you with a melee attack, you may deal damage to it of the chosen type. Equal to your class ability modifier, no reaction required. Once per creature or pack of minions per round, minimum two. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's nice. Let's see. Then we have then we have our first of the of the subtypes with Felborn, starting with Legacy of Asmodius. Attacks that blind you are made with disadvantage, and you may ignore up to four severity of the hidden condition granted to an enemy by darkness. You learn the light spell and may expend a vitality in order to choose a secondary option for the spell. This feature cannot be used with class features that grant you access to secondary options, and you gain proficiency in skullduggery. Um, I'm curious how that how that would interact with Eyes of the Infernal. Um, uh, Eyes of the Infernal, up to sort for I, I'm guessing it would stack. Mm -hmm. it, but only if it's hidden by, by you know darkness. Mm. So, a, a, and only by normal darkness because that's it doesn't indicate magical darkness. If yeah. it, it would only stack if it's normal darkness. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Legis Next is Legacy of Eros. You gain resistance to psychic damage. You learn the Enthrall spell and may expend a, vita may expend a vitality in order to choose a secondary option. We already, we already know where that's going. And you gain proficiency in Persuasion. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So next is Legacy of the Belfagori. You gain resistance to physical damage caused by necrosis or bleeding. Yeah, the physical condition damage. Because mm -hmm. defense is de defense damage is much different. Yeah. You learn the Wither spell and may expend a vitality in order to choose a secondary option, and you gain proficiency in history. I'm skipping nice. the second sentence on the whole. You learn, you learn the spell and make extend of vitality because it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. so, you yeah. learn the spell and you get the you get the spell, but it doesn't have any you know any of the other secondary option mm -hmm. accesses. Just spend a vitality. Yeah, and of course, if you got spell points, you can still use it. You can still use that to put in secondary options. I think I think no matter what, it's for those who are casters, it still counts towards their limit. Yeah, it's just it, it won't uh, it won't uh, be it, it's not used with class features that grant you access to no spell spell casting is a class feature monk. So even with uh, that, they'd ha even with that they'd have to they'd have to have a se have to have a separate angle. I think so. I think in this case, this means that they can't use the normal spell points to add secondary options. That might be good to 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 clarify that spell whether the spell casting tables are, do are considered class features. Mm -hmm. I think they are. I'm pretty sure spell casting was a class feature. So, so next is Legacy of Beelzebub. Gain resistance to poison damage. You learn the poison spell and may extend a vitality in order to choose a secondary option, and you gain proficiency in investigation. Hmm. <laughs> Let's see, then we have the legacy of Mammon. You gain resistance to frost damage. You learn the frost spell, and ag again can expend a vitality. And you gain proficiency in Arcana. Nice. See, then we have the legacy of Piraz. 
I think the legacies are for literally every every one of his demons in the setting. Yeah. Um, gain resistance of fire, you learn the fire spell, and get proficiency in athletics. Then we have the legacy of Tiamat. Gain resistance to acid damage. You learn the acid spell and gain proficiency in nature. And lastly, for the Felborn, you get you can get um, unnatural ability. Increase your intuition, wits, or resolve score by two. The chosen ability must be a core. <laughs> Uh, man, Felborn Inquisitor looking good. The qu the question you have to deal with is which le which which legacy if you go if you go down that route. Oh, that's easy. It would be a legacy of Beelzebub. Investigation monk. Investigation. If I already get inv investigation proficiency, now it's a tier of expertise. <laughs> So then we have gnomes, and we start uh, with grit and guile, which I'd say is their ab their ability one, which focuses on either constitution or wits, and it has to be a core. And third level. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next we have reactive armor. Armor is flawed. You can fix that with some tinkering, of course. After a rest, you may choose a set of armor and modifying it, granting it the following features. It grants its wearer one additional point of damage reduction. Whenever an enemy damages the wearer with an attack, the wearer gains one additional point of damage reduction until the beginning of their next turn. You may only grant the benefits of, of this feat to one set of armor at any given time. The effects of the reactive armor last until the end of your rest, and you may choose to modify a different set of armor at the end of a rest. Requires proficiency in forging. Okay. So, that's something to give to the tank. <laughs> to help out the tank, I should say. Indeed. Unless the gnome is the tank. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can do it. I mean, they do get constitution. Mm -hmm. So, then we have Volatile Glyph. Most... When you take damage from an enemy attack, you may expend a vitality in order to use your reaction and gain one of the following effects. The en one, the enemy w which attacked you takes damage equal to your fort score plus class ability modifier. Ow. You gain, da you gain damage reduction equal to your class ability modifier until the beginning of your next turn. This also reduces the damage done by the attack that triggers it. The enemy gains two severity of vulnerable... The enemy or the enemy becomes distracted, hidden three. Creatures immune to the compelled condition are also immune to this effect. Hmm. Um, so dev note works pretty This is a dev note about the next feature. Yeah. There's the habit of putting the dev notes after the feat, so that threw me off. Yeah. Um, that's why. Engineered construct. So your construct has its defense scores equal to your own. Your construct does not have hit points. Instead, when your construct takes damage, you may choose to take that damage in, in place of your construct. If you do so, your construct remains active and is unaffected by the damaging effect. If you do not take the damage in place of your construct, your construct disappears, leaving no body, but you may expend the vitality in order to summon it when you push forward or rest. If both you and your construct take damage from the same source, a fireball for example, you need not expend hit points to maintain your construct, but still take damage yourself. When your GM calls for an ability check, you may make a single roll for both you and your construct. Your construct is an extension of yourself, and while it may grant you bonuses to certain abilities, it does not make a, certain abil it does not make a separate ability check from you. Your construct always obeys your commands. In combat, your construct may move independently of you, but may not take actions or reactions, though it gains the benefits of the dash, dodge, disengage, or hide actions when you take those. Unless it has a feature which allows it to do so, your construct cannot speak. So then we have the whole thing of creating. And yeah, this is very much similar to wit to the wizard familiar. Mm -hmm. Let's see, so you have shared sense, you have etheric shift. Um, 
av the size ca we even wrote in familiar in a few spots accidentally it's probably transplanted mm -hmm. oh, then we have it probably the hasn't changed types. everything movement types the ab the ability and then and yeah yeah it works it works about what it it's exactly it, what it, it says on the t on the tin i'm i'm almost sure it was just copied and pasted yeah i'm pretty sure there's going to be some slight differences but not enough for but not enough for me to be all that anal about it i mean the in the biggest difference is creature type construct mm-hmm Instead of choosing like the different creature types, you could choose yeah. with the wizards familiar. Mm -hmm. So next is savant. Choose one skill with which you have proficiency. You gain three tiers of expertise in the chosen skill. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Next is the cog. So the about. Uh, I'd say so. I guess I guess callings are the equivalent to su to subspecies. Yeah, pretty much it. In this case, you gain proficiency in two artistries of your choice, and you gain proficiency in arcana. Then we have the we have the glyph. You may you may regain one additional spell point when you push forward. In addition, you may recover additional spell points as you level. I think this is similar to one of the ones we covered in the spell feats. If you already gain spell points equal to your spell maximum when you push forward, you gain plus two to spell attacks instead, and your threat range with spells increases by one. Nice. So then we have the hammer. You gain proficiency in forging. If you already have if you already have proficiency with it, you gain it in another artistry of your choice. Your climbing speed increases by ten feet. You have resistance to falling damage and damage dealt to you by falling objects. If you would receive a wound from falling, the severity of that wound is halved. You deal double damage to objects with, att with attacks and the threat range on attacks against objects and constructs increases by one as long as you could normally critically hit against the target. Sounds like the, ki sounds like the kind of feat you give someone who's specifically designed to fuck up golems. Mm-hmm. Let's see, next is the quill. You gain proficiency in history, your carry capacity increases by two, and you learn four languages. Jesus. Let's see, then we have the scale. You gain proficiency in persuasion, and you are able to create a magical pouch, an item unique to those like you. The pouch does not count against your carrying capacity and is treated as an additional personal effect. Unlike a normal pouch, the opening in this pouch is one feet in diameter, and the mouth of it leads to a small demiplane. It's a fucking bag of holding. A lesser bag of holding. Mm -hmm. Just don't combine it with a portable hole. Bad things happen when you do that. And if you have an engineer in your game, for the love of God, do not let them create an arrow that combines a portable hole with a bag of holding. Or at the very least, make it so make it so that's ridiculously expensive. So next, monk the one the one dragon killer arrow in Dragon's Dogma is ridiculously expensive. It's still worth it. Mm -hmm. So next we have bountiful luck. When you push forward, well, you may hold on. Go ahead. This is a halfling yep. feat. We're at halfling feats now. Mm -hmm. So when you push forward, you may expend a vitality in order to regain one use of your lucky feat. You may only use this ability once per short rest, and your vitality increases by one. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next we have Legacy of Titania. When you are dealt damage from a spell or magical effect, you may expend a vitality in order to gain resistance to that instance of the spell's damage. And you gain proficiency in persuasion and can attune to one additional magical item. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Then you have Legacy of Puck. While standing behind a creature that is at least one size category larger than you, you are hidden four from ranged attack that target your physical defenses as long as the creature stands between you and the origin of the attack in the case of AoE. 
and your move your movement increases by five feet and attacks roll to hinder vulnerable or enfeeble you are made at disadvantage not too sh not too shabby there <laughs> Oh, next is quick on the feet, which is there, uh, which is the halfling's ability feat. In this case, either dexterity or wits, and of course, it has to be a core ability, and you have to do this at third level or higher. Oh, then we have legacy of Oberon. When you are, which does it does the sa does the same thing about um about granting resistance against spells that hit spells that hit you at the cost of a vitality that we that we saw with um t that we saw with Tatiana you also gain Did blind sight you may ignore all severity of the hidden condition caused by non-magical darkness on targets within 10 feet of you you also gain dark vision you ignore up to four severity of the hidden condition caused by darkness not too sh not too shabby I can understand why uh, Oberon and Titania both grant the uh, re the expending of vitality to get resistance from spells. Mm -hmm. They are, after all, the king and queen of the Seely Court. Mm -hmm. See, next is Legacy of Yvain. You deal plus one damage with throwing pole arms, one-handed pole arms, crossbows, or any weapon with the light trait. You may attune to one additional magic item or trinket. Your swim speed increases by 10 feet, and your movement increases by 5 feet. And you can breathe underwater as if it were air. It's in interesting. So then, then we have second chance. When a creature you can see hits you with an attack roll, you can expend a vitality in order to use your reaction and increase your defenses by 3 for that attack and force the creature to re-roll. I hit you. No, you didn't. <laughs> Although if I feel I feel like there need I'm trying to wrap my head around the around the whole th thing of increasing defenses and force Actually no, it never mind. I I was just misreading it. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, do, do they still have to re-roll if they hit? Well, yeah, they do. So it's a case of not only do they have to re-roll, but they have to re-roll against a, at a, and try and hit a higher threshold. Yeah, because they hit you the first time. So what you did is spent a vitality to make it so that their hit isn't a hit. Or try to make it so that their hit isn't a hit. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next is Giant Slayer. Isn't that what Spoiler thinks she is? <laughs> yeah. Whenever you score a critical hit against an enemy with a weapon attack, you may expend a vitality in order to inflict the severity of the weakened condition equal to your proficiency modifier on that enemy. You and your al you and allies within 30 feet of you deal an additional plus one damage with your weaponed attacks when you strike enemies with the weakened condition and increase your and you increase your vitality by one. Very nice. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's a better use of Giant Slayer than what than what's been done in pre in other games, where it's a case of you do you you are better at fighting when enemies are one are bigger than you. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, which is certainly apropos and certainly fits the name, but it's also kind of specific. Yeah, it doesn't really fit the feel of what it means to be a Giant Slayer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And lastly, for halflings, we have Hound of Arcadia. You gain proficiency and one tier of expertise in the nature skill, or two tiers if you already have proficiency. And your movement, climb, sp swim, and horizontal jump speeds increase by five feet. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Good if you want to be that guy who runs around and does stuff. Yeah. See, then we have humans. Then we start with physical training. This is their ability one, and you can go with either strength, dexterity, or constitution. Has to be a core ability, although I'm curious why 
why this is why this one doesn't have the third level requirement. Feeling that some of the ones that have the third level requirement um are newer or were rebalanced. Because mm -hmm. remember he said that he's still rebalancing this one. Yeah. So next we have Born with Purpose. <laughs> I love the flavor text here. It's easy, just don't think too much and it'll come naturally. Choose a core choose a core ability. The minimum <coughs> roll for ability checks with the chosen ability is considered seven for the purposes of determining the total of your roll. Effects that would cause you to automatically fail still apply if you roll below a seven. You may take this feat multiple times, but must choose a different ability each time. Which means you can take it a total of three, because you only get three core skills. Yep. Or core abilities, I mean. Mm -hmm. So next is Prodigy. Yeah, I can do that, and that, and also that. Is this Deja Vu? I could have swore I saw that flavor text elsewhere. Uh, I think we saw it in a class at some point. I think it was in Rogue. Yep. Anyway, you gain two skill proficiencies of your choice, one artistry proficiency of your choice, and a fluency in one language of your choice. You must prioritize skills and artistries with which you do not have proficiency. And you choose one skill with which you have proficiency and gain one tier of expertise. So basically, you turn yourself into a, a semi-skill monkey. Mm-hmm. If you really want to make a rogue that is super roguey rogue, you'd probably, like, if you were looking to min-max it, you'd probably take a human rogue, and mm -hmm. you'd probably take this human feat. Yep. So then we have self-improvement. The two tens from your ability score array increase to 12. So this would then turn your ability score array into... From 10, 10, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, to just straight 12s. Mm -hmm. Which turns you into the perfect plus one all-rounder. Yeah. Let's see, and last for humans, we have adaptability. When you take this feat, choose three other feats for which you meet the prerequisites. You may only choose feats from the general, martial, or spell and ritual feats list, and may not choose to gain the chosen feats at a later time. If you pick a feat granted to you by a class feature and do not have the option of picking a different feat from that class feature, you may gain a feat of your cho choosing when you gain that feature instead of the specified feat. You may only receive the benefits of one of these chosen feats at any one time, but may switch between the chosen feats during a period of rest. Also, you may, you may not pick the half construct feat with this feature, because I'll find a way to, to word that more elegantly, but it don't make sense. I mean, the half construct feat is kind of a permanent change to your character to turn them half robot, mm -hmm. so it makes sense. Yeah, not to allow that to be one of your switchy feats. Yeah, because then you then you'd have to, I, if if someone were if someone argued that they wanted to do that, I would have to say, okay, you're gonna have to explain yourself, and you're gonna have to explain yourself very well, because you're already up against the hill as it is. Hmm. Let's see, and finally we have Orokai feats. Um, you should have written the titles for all of these feats in red, Tanner. Heh. Let's see. So first we, so first we have it. So it's it's sub it's particular subtype, which is tribes. Starting. With see, this is. Go ahead. And now this makes me even more. We've had tribes. We've we've had uh, legacies, we've had callings, you know, we've we've had uh, bloodlines. Second legacies, legacy of uh, there's two sets of legacies, but that makes sense. Mm -hmm. We've had bloodlines. Why not just call them dwarfen clans? I honestly think they should be renamed clan to get rid of the whole confusion of ancestry with the actual category of ancestry feats. That is my suggestion, Tanner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's we've um we've never been fans of the whole, we've never been fans of certain games that do the whole thing of character level, then class level, then spell level kind of thing. So Well, 
this is a little different. This me. This is just a terminological thing with me. Yeah. Just ha having ancestry and then having an then having um, ancestry. Having an ancestry feat called an ancestry makes terminology very confusing. Mm -hmm. Um. If you if you don't want to use ancestry, may maybe suggest instead heritage. Well, as much as I'd like to, as much as I'd like to go with the clan, if that's not, if that's not doable, that then heritage might be an alternative. Mm hmm. Uh, but it, anyway, and if you, go ahead. And if you wanted a unique um, term for every one of them, uh, legacies for halflings. But then you could call the ones for the Felborn something like. Uh, Um, descendant of, rather than legacy of. Mm -hmm. So next, so anyway, back to tribe of the wolf. You gain proficiency in investigation. You increase your intuition defense by one. You gain ten feet of movement. This movement may only be used to move toward any ally you can see within one hundred feet of you. Allies within 100 feet of you, you that you can see gain 10 feet of movement. This movement may only be used to move toward you. Allies within 100 feet of you that can see you mm -hmm. gain 10 feet of movement. Yep. Let's see. Next we have Blood of the Abyss. When another creature deals damage to you, you may use your reaction to gain the following traits until the end of your next turn. You gain resistance to all damage types, you gain this resistance before the damage is dealt, and you make attack rolls with advantage. Once you use this ability, you may not do so again until you push forward or rest. And you can speak, read, and write Abyssal. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next is Temple Initiate. Um. Oh. Increase two mental defenses of your choice by one. You gain proficiency and one tier of expertise in history, or two tiers of expertise if you already have proficiency. You learn two languages. The languages must be celestial or, abys or abyssal, unless you already know those languages. And That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Let's see, then we have Clairvoyant. You gain proficiency in the divination artistry. If you already have proficiency in divination, you gain proficiency in another ritual artistry of your choice. You may impose a wound on yourself to severity of the GM's choice of condition in order to divine at one tier higher than your current materials would normally allow for. You may expend one vitality in order to use a tier one divination ritual without expending any materials. So basically for those who want to do the whole shaman thing. And want to be a blood shaman at that. Mm -hmm. well, what am I talking about? That's a tautology. Yeah. Then we have Path of the Radiant. You learn the light dark you learn the light slash darkness spell. And may extend and may expend a vitality point in order to in order to choose a secondary option. You may only use this feature once each time you cast the spell, and if you are able to cast spells with spell points, this feature counts toward the maximum amount of spe secondary options you could normally channel into a spell. Mm -hmm. When you deal damage with the light darkness spell, it ignores an enemy's resistance to the spell damage if it has any, and you gain proficiency in history. <laughs> Ignore resistance. Nice. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have Tribe of the Lion. You gain proficiency with athletics and persuasion. You gain resistance to psychic damage, and attacks made to compel or frighten you are made with disadvantage. Increase the lowest defense of either your strength or resolve defense by two. If they're tied, pick one. Not too, not too bad. Uh, see, then we have Tribe of the Hyena. You learn one spell of your choice and may expend a vitality in order to choose a secondary option for the spell. 
You may only use this feature once each time you cast the spell. If you're able to cast spells with spell points, this feature counts toward the maximum amount of secondary options you could normally channel. You also gain damage reduction against spells equal to your proficiency modifier and gain proficiency in Arcana. Cool. So it's so not only are you a casty boy, but you're an anti-casty boy. Could be nice on an Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. Especially if you want that Inquisitor to lean a little bit towards FF14 Dark Knight. <laughs> Let's see, next is Tribe of the Vulture. You gain proficiency in nature and history. Your wits defense increases by two, and you increase your focus by two. Not too shabby. Let's see, next is Strength and Determination, so that's their ability entry. Increase either Strength or Resolve by two. Must be a chosen ability. And last is the Tribe of the Crow. You gain proficiency in Skullduggery and Investigation. Your Intuition Defense increases by 2, and your Wits Defense increases by 1. Your Dark Vision ignores an additional 3 Severity of Hidden, and you may utilize a 10-foot Quick Action to expend a Vitality, allowing you to apply your Dark Vision to areas of Magical Darkness until the end of your next turn. Yes. It's that that's cer that's cer that's certainly that's that's certainly going to hit that's certainly going to hit hard. So something that something that I can't that I can't help but I can't help but enjoy with the with these feats is that with each of the with each of the ancestry feats, there's there's a very clear there is a clear leaning to certain ar to certain archetypes, but it's not it's not blatant. It's not as if saying if you pick this ancestry, then you're probably picking one of these um, classes, which mm. is a bit of, is a bit of a problem. I mean, how? I mean, more often than not, we see el we see elven characters playing um, playing casters instead of martial characters in other in other games, for instance. And the dragonborn paladin and the tiefling warlock were popular builds back in 4th edition. Yeah. And to be fair, the bullet points um listing things for 4th edition races did say that they that they're going that they're going to have a bit of a leaning towards certain classes. But for this mm -hmm. one it's 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 I think what I like more about it is that it is that the leaning is not just in numbers but more in abilities that are going to be leaning towards that and it's not specific to one particular archetype. Like there are definitely ones that are gonna help your casty boy be more casty, but what casty boy that is is up to interpretation. Not to mention the fact that you don't have to take it to make your casty boy more casty. <clears throat> there are even ways of making your casty boy more casty with just the class features that they'll have. Mm-hmm. And within within all of the, within all of that, there is the, there is of there is of course the fact that we throughout this entire thing we did not see much of any prerequ prerequisite chains. I don't think we saw a sing I think the closest thing that we saw is one lucky one one feat that built off of lucky. Mm -hmm. It was halfling. It was the it was the um. Requires you to have the lucky feat because it allows you to get expended uses of lucky. It's yeah. bountiful luck. All of them were either based on rate on races, core ability, or proficiencies, and of and of course being able to cast spells. Well, being able to being able to use spell points is what I should is what I should say. But because of because of that, this sum. This particular approach is a is is an example on how to do feats properly, especially since unlike some, it isn't just throwing all of the feats into one into one section. 
Yeah. Also, I came up with a better with a better term than descendant lineage. Mm-hmm. Uh, considering the Felborns are descended from the demons, lineage of Asmodeus makes more sense than legacy. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I, ha- I have a few suggestions just to, just for uh, a with the with the dwarves to ter- to con- to prevent terminological confusion, and b uh, for the Felborn, because every other uh, every other ancestry has its own sub race or subtype feet mm-hmm. chain or feet feats, and they all have unique names. And I think rule of cool means Felborn should have their own unique name, unique name, and as well. Mm-hmm. Just me being me. Yeah. However, what? However, once the, t- however, um, in a f- in a few d- in a few days we will be we will be delving head f- we'll be delving head first into the encounterary and tackling the monster end of it. And after th- after that, we'll be more or less finished with the with this particular with this particular adventure. And of co- of course, afterwards I will. I'm already I'm already writing the script for it, but I want to do a musing a musing that's loosely comparing the two com- when it comes to the goal when it comes to the um, goals between the, between this and level up 5e because that was part that was part of the angle I had to begin with with this project. Mm-hmm. And I think I think one I think after the encounter we can get we can give our final th- our final thoughts. On the on the way, um, heavens and heresies has been develop has been developing. Yeah, definitely. So that that's so keep an eye on that in a few in a few days, and of course once heavens and heresies finishes, that doesn't mean that the valley of the judge will finish. We've got we've got some other stuff planned. One short term thing we're going to be doing in a, about a week. And one long-term thing that we're going to be doing, um, in in the in the coming days. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>